The title of my talk, Experimental Quantum Computing at IBM, it's a very generic uh, title. But what I wanted to talk about is the type of devices that we have and we use at IBM and focus on you know, what type of controls that we use to implement quantum gates and also the different methods that we use to characterize and mainly to understand our quantum system. And that would help us improve our devices and move uh, forward in terms of trying to use this as a good quantum computer. So, you know, quantum computing technologies. There are many types of quantum computing technologies, and you could ask question, what's your favorite qubit? And some might answer ions, photons, nanowires, solid state defects, neutral at atoms. But at IBM, we like superconducting circuits. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on this uh, superconducting circuits. And a very brief outline, as I said, I want to, the main part of this talk is going to be understanding our quantum system and discuss different things. And I know this, the topic of this workshop is um, quantum application, near-term applications, um, or approximate uh, quantum computing. So uh, briefly, I will talk about what can we do with noisy quantum system, uh, which is, I'm just going to talk briefly on our uh, recent results on quantum chemistry. So from the very basic, the type of qubits that we have is a single junction transplant qubits. We have, oh, nope. Oh, it doesn't show much. Uh, so here we have our Josephson junction. It's a layer of aluminum, aluminum oxide, aluminum. And the Josephson junction is the nonlinear inductor, which is the, for a transplant qubit, it's shunted by a large capacitor. So rather than having a harmonic oscillator, you can make this unharmonic oscillator so that the lowest two energy level is well separated from the higher levels. And we'll, we're going to use the lowest two um, energy level as our qubits. So here is our qubit. And what does it happen when you couple this to a resonator? A resonator is just a regular LC um, circuit. And here's the Hamiltonian of the interacting, um, interaction between the qubits and the resonator. And then the dispersive limit, where the qubit frequency is well detuned from the cavity, uh, resonate, uh, cavity frequency, the cavity frequency depends on the state of the qubit. So that is how we are going to read out the state of the qubit. Here is a sample of a two qubit device, two transplant qubits, coupled by a coupling cavity, which I'll call a bus. And each qubit has this readout cavity. And depending on the state of this qubit, when you put a tone, um, a microwave tone uh, in this cavity, you sweep the frequency, you'll see a state dependent resonance. So this is how we're going to probe the state of the qubit. And typically, we would have um, amplifier attached to the readout resonator. And we could do a high fidelity readout. Here's a histogram of the ground state and the excited state of the qubit. And you could see that the states are uh, very well separated. And you could get a fidelity, readout fidelity from that. So in terms of readout, so currently, uh, we have high fidelity, uh, high fidelity readout using some type of quantum limited amplifier, such as JPCs, TUPAS. But right now, we have a fairly slow readout and cavity emptying. That is due to the type, the, the design that we have. We have a relatively small chi and kappa. We also have a fairly slow initialization, because we're not doing any active reset. And this is also uh, without active reset. So this, uh, with, for active reset, we actually need to do um, you have to read out and you have to determine the state very fast. So I, talk, I place this latency budget with this small kappa and small chi. We need at least, uh, at, um, at least three microsecond, usually more. Uh, and the, this latency budget, what, what I mean is that from the time you start the measurement until the, uh, the cavity is emptied. So you know, once within this um, latency budget, right after this, you could run some other uh, qubit gate. But this doesn't mean, um, well, and then I'll just discuss what's in progress and what we're working on. What we like to have is a fast readout and also fast re uh, and reset. So with that, using FPGA, we could do fast readout and cavity emptying. 
just by designing it, um, just by engineering, just changing the kappa and chi's. And you could also do fast initialization by doing active reset. And here, a two latency budget, depending on how we design the kappa and chi, we could have this latency budget to be less than one microsecond, or with the higher chi, we could actually reach this 500 nanosecond. And using FPGA, this latency budget actually would include at the time it takes to determine the signal. So um, you could do an active reset right after this 500 nanosecond, and, uh, and then restart a new experiment. So this is something that we're working on. And now on coherence and scaling. So throughout many years, over the years, we have in superconducting qubits, we have made tremendous um, improvement in coherence time. And now we're reaching over 100 microseconds using a 10 to 100 nanosecond uh, gate times. So it's very important to note not just the coherence time, but to understand that we need fast gates. You know, having 100 microsecond gate uh, uh, coherence, you know, with microseconds and tens of microseconds of gate is not going to do much. And this is also an active area of research where we're studying some materials or other things to try to improve coherence. So in terms of scaling, here are different devices that we've had at IBM, starting from a two qubit device that I showed you earlier, three, four, five, this is one of the quantum experience device, the seven, eight, and then the 16 qubit, 22 buses, that's the newer quantum experience device, IBM QX5 that we have now. And we have also announced uh, our commercial program, the 20 qubit and 50 qubit device with these connectivities. So we're always, in, along with improving the coherence, we're, improving, uh, we're increasing the number of qubits. And what are the other things that we're working on? So quantum gates. So this, again, is going to go back to basic. How do we control the qubit state? So for single qubit, you want to uh, bring qubit uh, on the, this block sphere. And how we do it is by putting this microwave tone through this readout resonator. Our typical qubit frequencies are around 5 gigahertz. And by putting this tone, you could rotate the, the qubit. Um, you could derive the oscillation. And by pulse shaping, you could prepare uh, um, like an X gate or a Y gate. And you could calibrate that well. This is a picture of Jerry just in the lab in front of the equipment. OK, so here I'm showing two different phases. So as I said, depending on the pulse shape that you make, you could rotate the qubit you know, 90 degrees. And then just by changing the phase, you could do a Y90 operation. So this is the same calibration method you use, um, calibrate an X90 gate. And just by having an extra phase or an angle, changing the angle, you could um, apply a Y90 gate. So how about Z gate? Z gate is a little bit different. And you could look at um, Dave Mackay's paper. Uh, it's a special gate where it's just done in software. So as I said, from going from X90 to Y90 is just the, uh, the change in the, uh, the angle. So for phase gate, the way we implement the gate, you could do this in software. So it's kind of a virtual Z gate. So this gate for our system doesn't cost any time. So you could think of it as a, a free gate that you could apply. So these were single qubit gates. How about two qubit gates? In superconducting qubits, there are different types of two qubit gates that you could, you could use. Here's some list. But for this talk, I'm going to focus on the first one, cross resonance gate. It's a CR gate. Um, and the, the pro is that you could use fixed frequency qubits, and it has fairly long coherence. But the cross resonance gate work well within certain uh, frequency range. So that could be uh, difficult. Nonetheless, we have uh, qubits where the cross resonance gate is an all microwave entangling gate. So as I said, you could use this fixed frequency qubits. And two qubits are coupled with uh, this static, um, there's a static J coupling through this bus that hybridizes the qubit levels. And so here's qubit one, qubit two. By driving the first qubit, the control qubit, at the frequency of the second qubit, qubit two's tone, 
you could drive this zx term so that it only drives the second qubit depending on the state of the control. So this zx that you get from this cross resonance gate, that is the gate that we use to make a, a C0 gate. So back in 2011, there was the first dem uh, experimental demonstration using this cross resonance gate. And back then there was only, you know, you use this single cross resonance gate um, and the fidelity of the gate was in the order of 81%. But over time, they were, we've um, implemented a echo sequence and more recently have done an active cancellation, the same echoing sequence but, but with the active cancellation to cancel out extra terms in the Hamiltonian. So the cross resonance gate has this ZX term, but there are other terms that we don't want when we're uh, making a C0 gate. So with that, we uh, have, or have reached 99.1 uh, gate fidelity, uh, looking at the interleaved randomized benchmarking. So here, up to here, single qubit and two qubit, and what are the other multi-qubit characterizations that you could do? So with two qubit, the typical exp experiments that we run, because we have this always on coupling with this bus, we typically look at ZZ coupling, the static ZZ that exists. So the type that we run, the experiment that we run, we call it the joint <coughs> amplification of ZZ, the jazz. Um, and the, we run two different experiments. Uh, so the first, ex the first qubit, this is the qubit that you're going to be measuring. You run, you bring it to, um, you apply a pi over two, and you do an echo, uh, the pi, and then another uh, pi over two in a different angle. So it's not too important here what we're doing here, but the difference is that for the first experiment, we have the second qubit in excited state, and the other experiment you run it without this pi. And then you're going to compare the frequency difference that you observe on the first qubit. By comparing this frequency, you obtain that these, this, for this sample, for this two qubit, we had a 300 kilohertz static ZZ. So you could run this ZZ experiment, the jazz experiment, on a multi-qubit system. This is uh, from an IBM QX1 device. It was the first uh, quant Q, uh, IBM Q experience device that we had. And here's the table of ZZ between all the pairs. And these epsilons are um, just if the ZZs are fairly small, which makes sense with the D1 and D3. It's not on the same bus, so there's a negligible ZZ coupling. So as you see from this table, D1 and S1 has the highest ZZ, just about 90 kilohertz. So for the, when you characterize uh, the qubits, you could get the frequencies, um, and then to characterize the gates, you could run uh, randomized benchmarking. So typical uh, experiments that we do to uh, verify the gates are running individual randomized benchmarking. That means you run benchmarking on single qubit while all the other qubits are in the ground state. And you could also run simultaneous randomized benchmarking. That is, you run uh, Clifford randomized benchmarking on these single qubits all at the same time. And what you, I want to show is comparing this row and this row, the largest change that you see in the error are on D1 and S1. So this randomized, randomized benchmarking result is capturing this ZZ, the high ZZ that I have between these, uh, the pair. This is one method of uh, looking at crosstalk on a multi-qubit system. So what are other things that we could look for? So when I ran this 422 code experiment, this looking for error wasn't the point of this experiment, but uh, nonetheless, I was running, looking at the 422 code, just to briefly go over what this is, is a 422 code is a four qubit code. There's a two logical qubit, logical state that you could encode, L1 and L2. And the idea is the L1, the, the one of those two qubit, the two logical qubit, could be uh, prepared full torrently, but the other one is not. So, for example, the logical zero zero state, the little p, that's the protected qubit, and then the other one is the gauge qubit. So the protected qubit, this is the one that you could prepare. Uh, full torrently. And these are the two stabilizers. And you could define all these logical 
a bit flip and phase flip for each of the logical states. So the experiments that we, I run was to first prepare a logical plus plus state. That is by running uh, the, the X stabilizers and then uh, preparing the state by measurement. So I start with the syndrome qubit at the excited state. And then, so then at the end, I only post select when the syndrome is at one and that this would prepare this plus plus state. So once you prepare by measurement, you could do a post rotation to run state tomography, measure the rest of the four qubit and make a reconstructed, reconstructed states. So typically for uh, reconstruct, reconstructed states, you'll use the computational basis, but to look at this logical qubits, we're going to define a new basis where the first two strings are gonna be the logical states, and then the, the third and the fourth are um, syndrome bits, which one of them detects the phase error, and the other one detects the bit flip error. So these syndrome bits could be flipped by using these destabilizers, and these uh, change the stabilizer eigenvalues without changing uh, logical observables. So looking here, so you could start from say a zero zero or a plus plus state, and here I'm writing a perfect zero zero, uh, the S, SZ and SX is zero zero. So this is the, uh, the proper um, logical plus plus state, and by applying you know, either a phase flip or a phase flip on the logical one or applying destabilizer, you could change these bits, that the four string bits. And this is gonna be the new basis I'm going to use to look at the reconstructed states. And just to note that I'm gonna uh, uh, um, define the acceptance probability, uh, which means the, uh, the probability that the state is in this encoded state as probability of SZ and SX being one. I'm sorry, being in uh, zero, zero. So here's the result when you use that cross, uh, the C naught gate that I had from the five qubit device. Um, and here, corner on the ye yellow corner, this is the, the um, qubits that's in the logical space. And when you actually look at the acceptance probability, it's very low. It's only, it's less than 30%. So clearly uh, there are a lot of states that is outside in this code space. And so from this, you could see that the code is very sensitive to certain errors. So when I was looking at these two qubit gate and run around as benchmarking, each individually, these two qubit gates had a you know, decent um, gate fidelity. So I didn't assume to get this bad of acceptance probability. So what is the type of error that we have? So I talked about cross-resonance gate a little bit earlier. And this ZX, so this is the drive Hamiltonian, the CR uh, drive Hamiltonian. And this ZX term, this is the one that you want to make the C naught gate. And uh, so this is the terms between this control and target qubit. And when you apply this echoed cross resonance gate, what you're doing is you're canceling out all these terms, except for, um, except for IZ in, in this line. But when you consider not just this two qubit, but other qubits that's coupled to this pair, say D2, three, and four, which I'll call them the spectator qubits. And when you actually consider other Z terms that's associated with it, this echo cross resonance, two, two, um, two pulse cross resonance gate only cancel these terms out and there are several other Z terms that's left. So how do we get rid of that? So you could do uh, some other echoing scheme where you could divide it up to four cross resonance gate and do a four CR pulse C naught gate. So by doing, by splitting these gates you could cancel all these um, other Z uh, errors. So here, uh, there, so there are four pairs of CR, and all the CR, the C naught gates were less than 0.02, 2.5% uh, error. Uh, and 
for the four, four ball CR, the air per gate was a little higher. That's mainly due to the, uh, the gate being a little bit longer and also having more pulses. Nonetheless, when you actually run the same experiment trying to make this uh, logical state, the 422 code state, so here's the previous result using the 2 pulse CR, and this is with the 4 pulse CR. So now, as you see, um, most of the states are in this accepted, uh, in this, um, accepted state, the, it's 79% uh, acceptance probability. And then, so you could see, and all the errors that we had previously is gone. So the, by running this state tomography on, on, of this 422 code, we noticed that there was some sort of error. Didn't tell us what exactly, except for that it was uh, um, a bit flip, well, it, but in plus plus states, so it's more of a phase flip. Uh, and then we were able to come up with a different scheme of gates so that we get rid of this error. But this is not a very convenient way of figuring out that there's an error on your multi-qubit system. And the state tomography does take a long time. It's compared to methods like uh, randomized benchmarking, which doesn't take a lot of time. It's fairly easy. So what are some other methods that we could use to, um, to understand our gates? So some of the verification toolbox that we have discuss are the randomized benchmarking. So we have the standard RB, interleaved RB, I didn't talk about purity and leakage, but these are all kind of standard um, randomized benchmarking that you could run on single qubit. And for multi-qubit, so you could run the standard n qubit RB. So I've done a two qubit RB, but you could think about doing a three qubit RB. And the simultaneous one qubit RB, this, is, uh, this was done on this device where we saw some ZZ errors. Uh, but also, instead of just running this two qubit um, RB and a single qubit simultaneous RB, you could run this simultaneously to see what, you, what other errors that you might, you might uh, to see that there is an error. So here is a picture of our IBM QX uh, five qubit device. And so these are the typical numbers that you would get on our quantum experience website, the T1, T2s, and the single qubit error per gate, two qubit error per gate. And also we have this ZZ information on our spec sheet, which you could get it from the, our uh, quiz kit, or our GitHub. Okay, so now this two qubit RB, this is the number that we, we, we provide. But let's start looking at some other things like simultaneous two qubit with single qubit RB. On our current IBM QX4 device, so one of the pairs, CR, uh, uh, CR, C0, here's a number that you get from, one, from a two qubit, experiment, two qubit RB experiment. We get about 2.4 uh, error per gate. And when you actually include this other spectator qubit and run two qubit and single qubit RB, actually for this gate, it doesn't change much. And this is showing that there's not a lot of crosstalk, which is good. So let's look at another pair, uh, CR34, so CX34. So again, the error per gate is less than 3%. But once you add this central qubit, now the error per gate is above 7%. So just by doing this simultaneous two qubit and one qubit, we clearly see that there is some sort of crosstalk, and we see this error. So now you could use, this is a fast method uh, to see that there is some, some type of crosstalk, and now we could try to uh, think about how we could correct for this. So just to kind of see, this is um, some new experiments that we're running. Uh, you can, there will be a new manuscript by Dave Mackay soon on archive, I hope. Um, so some three qubit RB could be another way of seeing some uh, multi-qubit crosstalks. So it's just a standard three qubit RB, uh, and depending on the connectivity, so you see, so usually we don't have a three qubit entangling gate. We would have a two qubit entangling gate, but if they're fully connected, you would, to create a one 
um, three qubit Clifford, you need about three and a half C naughts. And if it doesn't have a full connectivity, it requires more C naughts. So clearly you would have, um, you would be able to run it better when you have a better, or when you have a better connectivity. So here's some results from IBM QX4. So here's the three qubit benchmark um, RB. And I'm putting down the two qubit RB results just by looking at the two qubit individually and then by looking at two qubit and one qubit. So again, so these gate, this gate doesn't change much and none of these really um, made a lot of difference. And the number we get from the three qubit error per Clifford is sort of in the, or, the order that we would expect from this two qubit gate. So, but with, uh, with the same pairs, but with limited connectivity, so that I took out one of the gates, one of the C0, now you're, you're using a lot more C0 gates per three qubit um, Clifford. Now the three qubit error per Clifford is a little higher, but again, by knowing how many C0 and these errors, the error per Clifford uh, matches fairly well to what we would ex expect. So here, it's probably why you might want to see our new uh, cube, 20 qubit device. So here there are 20 qubits with, some, with all the couplings. It's showing the T1, T2s, and the, the uh, C naught gate between the pairs that are coupled. And as you see, it's the t, you know, we have decent T1 and T2s for all the qubits. And this is very different from you know, the type of device that we have from the quantum experience, the five qubit and 16 qubit, mainly on, in terms of this is one of the first devices that we're showing where you know, it's not, uh, it doesn't, it, you could control some qubits that are not on the edge, edge of the sample. So you know, they're, they're, these are just the numbers that we, we would typically um, put on the similar number as what we would put on in the quantum experience. And on this device as well, we've run uh, a three qubit RB. And again, um, so for this one, it didn't run the simultaneous two qubit and one qubit, but uh, using the two qubit RB from the, from the mapping, the previous mapping, um, you get, from, from these number, it should be, the error per Clifford should, might be, should be a little lower, but probably by looking at the two qubit and single qubit RB, you probably could be able to see a fairly um, uh, appropriate number for the three qubit error per Clifford. And again, uh, same, same pairs, but with, different, um, with the different connectivity, and you see that the error per Clifford goes up. So now, so all that together, I'd like to discuss a little bit about quantum volume. So quantum volume is something that at IBM we've been talking about, started talking um, in terms of how, what type of metrics that we could use to describe what, um, how good our quantum processor is. So as we increase the number of qubits, you know, more number of qubits is good. But if you don't decrease the error rate, it doesn't do much for us, right? So you want more qubits but less error and from the three qubit RB as well, you see that more connectivity that you have, you could run more things. So the more connectivity is better. And also gate set. So right now we have you know, a, uh, just a CNOT gate for an entangling gate. But if you have some other gates that would help you in terms of creating um, some algorithms. So to quantify this, trying to quantify this quantum volume, uh, you could think of the number of qubits as a width and some depth D to uh, think about this circuit over some gate set. And the total space-time volume circuit V is this number of qubit times the depth. And it's this, uh, this is limited by the um, effective error rate. Right? So how we, what we want to come up with a num is a number where it actually kind of describes how good this, 
uh, these devices. And so we want to come up with the largest square here. So the, we're going to define uh, quantum volume as 2 to the minimum of either the number of qubits or depth. So we're doing this because you know you could we tried to improve the two qubit gate fidelity, and we'd like to do that, right? But just with two qubit, even if you do um, run more more and more depth, you know you could easily simulate a two qubit system. What we want is that good, the uh, you know, low error uh, two qubit error rate, or and and also the depth. So the model alg algorithm that we are going to use is uh, so this this is just a random two qubit gate unitary the SU four gate um, cho choose uh, from um, some SU four gate SU, SU, yeah, SU four gate you choose you permutate these qubits and you choose another random two pairs from the set of qubits and how we're going to define um, in of a unit of depth is just operation of unit uh, two qubit <coughs> unitary on a pair of qubit. So we're going to assume that that circuit is we could we could simulate this circuit. And so we're going to have this ideal output probability, and then we're also going to have this experimental um, probability uh, output uh, probability distri distribution. And you could consider two different metrics. One is how far away these ideal and experimental states are. It's L1. And then you could also think about probability of heavy output, which is described in uh, this Aronson and Chen paper. I won't explain it here. So uh, just as an example, this was a data taken on our old quantum experience device, IBM QX2 device. <laughs> But so here's the simulation with depth one. Uh, so that requires, uh, so this is on five qubits, but with, for depth one, it only requires, for this example, it required 60 knots. And then this is the experimental result. And you see that you know, most of them are, um, uh, this corresponds fairly well. But with this depth four, and you know it, this is taking this is requiring now 39 C naughts. Now the output distribution is fairly random now. So when you plot this out, the number of qubit, you look at different number of qubits on the same device, and then you run this this um, modal alg algorithm many times on different different depth, and you could plot out the, the probability of heavy output. And we kind of just could define you know, success at, as, say, 2 third if you have the probability of heavy output as greater than 0.6. And if you define it th th this way, we get a quantum volume of 8. That is, we could, you know, we have you know, 5 qubits total here, but we, don't, we could only go up to depth 3. So similarly, you could run it for the 16 qubit device. And here, you could run it on 3 qubit, 4 qubit, 5 qubit, and even long more. But again, you don't reach, um, you don't reach any uh, improvement in terms of depth. So for the IBM 5 qubit and 16 qubit device, even though we have the more numbers of qubit on the 16 qubit, we have equal quantum volume. Uh, so which uh, now we, we have it as eight. So here, you know, when we went from five qubit to 16 qubit, we didn't really improve too much in terms of uh, the gate errors. So you know, that, that's, this is shown from this quantum volume metric. So to finish up the first part of the talk, or most part of the talk, uh, <laughs> we talked about what the, the qubits that we have and some characterization methods so we're always working on improving coherence, gate fidelity, and readout as we scale up. So that's what we need. And we, I've defined a metric quantum volume to kind of start using to understand that um, how well we're doing, how, how well we're improving on all these aspects of the device. So just very, very quickly, and I think uh, most of the 
people in the audience probably know this the um, experiment well. But it's a quantum chemistry with noisy superconducting qubits. I could probably skip the motivation. And the idea is to find the, uh, the minimum energy of this electronic structure problem. And that could help you to find the reaction pathways, uh, reaction rates, and molecular, molecular geometry. So again, so the, the type of experiments that we want to run, uh, we run was this um, hybrid quantum classical approach. Some references here. So we would map the problem, the, uh, the electronic structure problem, onto, uh, the, to qubit pallies. And I think, I'm not sure if Sergey is here now, but you could ask Sergey all about this method that we use to uh, lessen the number of qubits required to run this later if you want. And then we prepare at some trial state using a hardware efficient way. And then you, uh, you do a partial state tomography to uh, obtain the energies, and you feed it to the classical computer. And then from that, using a classical optimization, you come up with the different parameters, and you run the experiment over and over to minimize the energy. So the hardware efficient trial state preparation uses some SU2 gate, which we could use using the single qubit rotation uh, with some uh, with, uh, with some phase gate. And here, this is the U entangling gate. So this could be any ent uh, entangling gate that you ha could have in a device. So this is the hardware efficient part. For the paper, what we did was not actually use like a C0 gate, a calibrated gate, but we just turn on the CR tone. So the CR tone, as I discussed earlier, has this DX terms, and there are some other terms as well. But for this entangling part, it, it, you know, it's okay to have some uh, coherent, if it's a coherent operation, it's fine. So you don't want to run um, something you don't understand, but by just by applying some CR gate, you're applying some sort of uh, entangling gate. And uh, with 3D plus 2N variational parameters, you could uh, make these trial states. And also this depth, that's the number of entangling gate that you apply. You could set that by uh, depending on the, the amount of coherence that you have. So just quickly for the hydrogen, I'm showing the two different um, place with the, the two different um, interatomic distance at equilibrium and dissociation. So depending on that distance, you would have a different Hamiltonian. And these are the terms, the poly terms that you want to calculate. So we have five poly terms for the hydrogen. And out of these five, we, 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 we usually would uh, put them together and only run a few experiments, the partial state tomography. So for these five poly terms, we only had to uh, measure two different states to uh, get those numbers. For lithium hydride, we use four qubits, 100 poly terms, so it goes up quite a bit. But again, you could set, put them into sets of 25 and then um, even more for the six qubit beryllium, beryllium, beryllium hydride um, simulation. There are 165 poly terms, but uh, you could kind of group them into 44 sets. So this sort of came up yesterday as well, but so this dotted line on this graph, this plot is the actual energy. The black dots are the experimental results with these density plots is from the numerical simulation using what we understand about the device. So these are some, some uh, things that we know about the device. So that what brings this error is the decoherence, sampling errors, limited iteration, accuracy of the classical optimizer, and also insufficient depth. So this kink um, is due to not having enough depth. So all these experiments were done with deep, uh, depth one. So now it's just a conclusion. So just the, the, I want to point out three points from the, our uh, quantum chemistry paper. The one new thing was this hardware efficient qubit mapping. Again, you um, could ask Sergey about this. And then also this hardware efficient trial state preparation. So this is very flexible to other hardware uh, problem, uh, platforms. And also we use this fast and um, classical optimizer that is robust to stochastic errors. And 
the point was that we understand, we, um, again, the energy that we got is not, you know, at the accurate level, but it's very, um, we could, we understood it by running this numerical simulation. And by understanding this experiment, you know, there is, um, is promising uh, in the path forward with the error mitigation method. Or you could see uh, Kristen's paper, and he's sitting somewhere on here, so you could ask him about that. And just to wrap it up, so what, we do, what do we want to run this better? So we want to increase sampling that would improve the energy estimate, and that would require some uh, reset. So I talked about um, doing some fast readout, fast reset. So that's that, what we're working on that is going to help us with uh, being able to take more samples. And increased coherence that will let you do more depth, have, have more depth in the circuits. And uh, along with that, if you have more connectivity, you actually would require less depth. So that's also what we want. So at the end, we want to work towards larger quantum volume, which should improve in all aspects of our experiments. Thanks. Thanks, Micah, for a fascinating talk. We have time for one or two quick questions. Hi. <clears throat> so in the hardware efficient mapping and variation approach that you're doing, um, I'm worried that, I mean, it looks to me like you're doing sort of a random circuit. And then because you have these gates with sort of random parameters, and then you measure something, and then you're going to try to optimize those parameters to converge to what you want. But I, I think that, you know, when you do that and you measure pretty much whatever you measure, you're going to concentrate exponentially into the average value over the Hilbert space. I think you will have to take exponential number of measurements to then find better values for the parameters. Am I wrong about that? Sorry, uh, this is for the... Uh, hardware efficient the hardware mapping, right. uh, hardware so efficient, the... you know, uh, optimization that you're doing of the parameters for chemistry. So for this experiment, we fixed the t amount of time for the, we applied the cross resonance gate, which uh, we know how much ZX we had, how much you know, IX or other terms that we had. So uh, we use that number as to put with the numerical, uh, as, as a model and run numerical, numerical simulation. And um, so these, th this parameter, the, the length of the CR or the angle of the CR, this also could be parameterized. So right now, the n plus 2 times, oh, sorry, 3 plus 2 times n parameters that we run over, those were just for single qubit rotations, and we didn't actually change the entangling part. But that, that is the, uh, a, a parameter that we could easily add in to. I don't know if that answers. No. No, <laughs> no, not at all. No, I mean, <laughs> if, uh, so the parameters, you know, it's OK. It's not a big number of parameters. I'm worried that when you try to measure to then get you know, whatever observable to optimize whatever you're doing. In this case, you know, getting closer to the ground state of a molecule. Uh, your observables are going to concentrate exponentially just on, you know, like zero or whatever. And then you're going to take an exponential number of measurements to be able to, you know, do a gradient descent or whatever you want to do to move the parameters to a better setting. I, I, I don't what, not worry about the number of parameters. It's the number of measurements to get a signal. The number of. So it is not like a fully random circuit. Uh, it is like a circuit with a certain topology that has worked for this, like a uh, small, medium sized molecule. And then I guess if you want to ask you about uh, <coughs> thinking of like a mixture between efficiency uh, ansatz and uh, hardware efficiency. So, it's not like it's other questions? Yeah. Um, on, on the final uh, molecule, I think it's beryllium hydride, when you showed the results of the simulation of the model, there's um, a second curve that appears above the ground state curve. And so I was wondering, is that the, um, the classical optimizer in conjunction with the noise model finding a another local minimum in their result? Yeah. <laughs> okay.
Oh, for, for this. For where the hump. Yeah, yes. Yeah, no, for the other one with the two different uh, results. Other questions or comments? Uh, I just, I just want to ask. Um, you did a lot of characterization and verification, and as we heard yesterday in Shelby's talk, theorists like to come up with, as she put it, all these sexy machine learning algorithms that um, experimentalists don't really want to touch. And I was wondering, as your, as your cube, as your system's getting bigger and bigger, have you ever been, have, have you ever tried machine learning to perform some of those tasks, or have you ever start, start thinking about that? Uh, I mean, we haven't you know, implemented or <laughs> machine learning, but I think there is there is a direction that you know we all need to think about in terms of characterizing multi-qubit. Uh, last last question, Nathan. All right. Um, so uh, those fancy machine learning methods are pretty cool for the record. But anyways. Um, <laughs> The uh, question I have is for the uh, uh, 16, uh, the 20 qubit system that you were looking at, did you consider changing the effective number of qubits in order to try to optimize the quantum volume? Because you don't necessarily get the best quantum volume by turning on all the qubits. So is that the way you want to go forward, or should you always just give the quantum volume for the entire chip? Oh, that, uh, <laughs> the quantum volume question, you should, there's a Lev or Andrew in the audience. Drew or Lev? Could I just maybe ask, like, um, why optimize the quantum volume? Oh, I mean, I know so that I, I'm, the, uh, I'm not I, saying it's poorly motivated. I'm just saying it's clearly a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a proxy. You know, so why optimize the proxy when you know for a fact that it's a proxy? Right. So, um, if anyone else wants to say something, but, uh, <laughs> uh, um, for quantum volume, it, this is not the metric that we're, you know, sure. thinking the way that we describe as the only thing that you know we need to think, care about. But we want to come up with a simple metric that we could, you know, study over different types of devices that we could easily implement to kind of have to com to be able to compare. So, you know, there might be other methods, and sure. you know, yeah. <laughs> Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank all the speakers from the afternoon session.